Good morning and welcome to the ConAgra Brands third quarter fiscal year 2020 earnings conference call. All participants will be in a listen only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note, this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Brian Carney from Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'll remind you that we will be making some forward-looking statements during today's call. While we are making those statements in good faith, we do not have any guarantee about the results that we will achieve. Descriptions of the risk factors are included in the documents we filed with the SEC. Also, we will be discussing some non-GAAP financial measures. References to adjusted items, including organic net sales, refer to measures that exclude items management believes impact the comparability for the period referenced. Please see the earnings release for additional information on our comparability items. The reconciliations to those adjusted measures to the most directly comparable gap measures can be found in either the earnings release or in the earnings slides, both of which can be found in the investor relations section of our website, ConagraBrands.com. Finally, we will be making references to total ConAgra brands as well as the legacy ConAgra brands. References to legacy ConAgra brands refer to measures that exclude any income or expenses associated with the acquired Pinnacle Foods business. With that, I'll turn it over to Sean. Thanks, Brian. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our third quarter fiscal 2020 earnings call. On behalf of ConAgra Brands, I want to start by expressing my heartfelt hope that you and your families are staying safe during this unprecedented time. Today, I'm going to address two main topics, our response to COVID-19 and its impact on our business, as well as the underlying trends that we saw in the third quarter, which ended just before the impact of COVID-19 started. Rest assured that we're taking all necessary precautions to protect the health and safety of our employees and our ability to safely and reliably meet consumers' needs. For the most recent status of our efforts to respond to COVID-19, please visit ConAgraBrands.com. We'll continue to provide updated information on our site as the situation evolves. As I'll describe in more detail in a moment, we've taken a number of steps to ensure our supply chain continues to operate well. We're incredibly proud of our teams who have been producing and delivering without disruption. While we all remain focused on executing through this rapidly evolving situation, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we've made significant progress against the operational objectives we established for fiscal 2020. In many ways, our progress against these objectives is enhancing our ability to navigate this crisis. Recall, at the outset of fiscal 2020, we set out to execute on integration, synergy capture and deleveraging, drive strong consumption growth in frozen and snacks, improve trends in Hunt's Tomatoes and Chef Boyardee, bend the trend in the legacy pinnacle business, and drive innovation and growth in Gardein. I'm proud to say that through the third quarter, we remain squarely on track with all of these objectives. And from a financial standpoint, the third quarter results are in line with the expectations we provided at Cagney. As we previously described, industry softness, which started in December in food service and pivoted to retail in January, put pressure on consumption trends in several of our key categories, which more than offset share gains. As expected, consumption trends recovered in February prior to COVID-19 impact. It's important to keep in mind that our third quarter ended on February 23rd. At that time, there were very few reported cases in the U.S., and notably, no widespread change in behavior. As we all know, that has changed significantly in recent weeks. From the second week of our fiscal fourth quarter to date, we've experienced the unprecedented impact of COVID-19 as consumers have stocked up on food and shifted rapidly to eating more at home. Given the quality of our brands and the categories we participate in, ConAgra is well positioned to serve consumers during this time of disruption and extraordinary demand. Our team is hard at work in close coordination with our customers to ensure that consumers have access to the food they need to stay safe at home. At 
this point, the magnitude and duration of the COVID-19 impact is still uncertain. However, I can tell you that we expect to exceed our prior full year guidance for total company sales and profit metrics, assuming the end-to-end -end supply chain continues to operate effectively. We will provide more detail on the impact of COVID-19 in a moment, but first, we would like to walk you through the highlights of the third quarter. During the third quarter, our performance was in line with the updated expectations that we provided at Cagney. Organic net sales growth decreased 1.7%, while our adjusted operating margin was 15.7%, and our adjusted diluted EPS from continuing operations was 47 cents for the quarter. As we noted at Cagney, we saw a category softness in January that was greater than anticipated. At the time, we told you that our more recent data was improving and we expected to bounce back. And that's exactly what happened. As you can see on slide seven, total ConAgra retail sales returned to growth in the final four weeks of February and sustained a normal rate into the first week of Q4. Clearly, even before the current disruption due to COVID-19, we were well on track and had already seen the expected rebound in consumption trends. Not only did we see growth of 0.9% in the four weeks ended February 23rd, but what we saw in the week ended March 1, which is in our fiscal fourth quarter, reaffirmed this return to consumption growth. And during the quarter, we continued to deliver on integration, synergies, and deleveraging. On integration, we have been converting legacy pinnacle plants over to SAP, and through Q3, this multi-year process has been progressing on plan. We captured 33 million in incremental synergies, increasing our total through the end of Q3 to 145 million. And we made further progress on reducing our net debt position by paying down 450 million of debt during the quarter. Slide nine demonstrates our continued success in the important frozen category. As both graphics demonstrate, we maintained strong growth during the quarter across our frozen portfolio, both for total ConAgra brands and legacy ConAgra brands. As we will discuss later in the presentation, total ConAgra's frozen growth has been driven by both legacy ConAgra and legacy Pinnacle. Slide 10 shows the outsized performance of ConAgra's frozen meals within the category. Not only did we have yet another quarter of gaining share of shelf and share of sales, but we also did so at an accelerated rate. Our snack segment reported solid growth in the third quarter. Total snacks were up 2.9% during the quarter and 8.7% on a two-year basis. Our results were led by our meat snacks and seeds businesses, which delivered growth of 8.4% and 5.9% respectively. And as slide 12 shows, we continued to gain share in many of our snack categories in Q3. Another key objective for fiscal 2020 was to improve trends in Hunt's Tomatoes and Chef Boyardee. As you can see on slide 13, that's just what we've done. Over the five week period ended February 23rd, Hunt's Tomatoes and Chef Boyardee gained 2.2% and 4.5% in dollar sales growth respectively. And both brands also grew share of retail sales over that same period as outlined on slide 14. It's worth noting that these trends for Hunt's Tomatoes and Chef Boyardee continued into the first week of our fiscal fourth quarter prior to the impact of COVID-19. Slide 15 shows a milestone for Conagra as we bent the trend on Legacy Pinnacle on both a one-year and a two-year basis. Recall that in December 2018, we outlined a number of actions that were needed to get Pinnacle back on track. We also indicated that we did not expect to see the impact of those actions until the second half of fiscal 2020, which as you can see here is exactly what has occurred. And slide 16 shows how we've been able to bend the trend in the big three legacy pinnacle brands by implementing the ConAgra Way playbook. We started with Wishbone, where the missteps came from several executional issues, including a label change, which we quickly addressed to stabilize the brand. As a result, we saw an immediate spike in retail sales before returning to more normal levels. Birdseye, which is our biggest brand, took a little longer 
as the playbook required us to remove lower performing SKUs, which negatively impacted sales and distribution. Notably, Birdseye is now contributing to our growth as the innovation we launched in the first half of fiscal 2020 builds momentum, with more innovation to come. With respect to Duncan Hines, we've made great progress on reframing the brand as a sweet treat, but recognize that there's more work to be done. We're focused on introducing more on-trend innovation as we trim lower performing SKUs. While it will take time to return this brand to growth, we're confident in the ongoing implementation of the ConAgra Way playbook. Another legacy pinnacle brand that has benefited from the ConAgra Way is Gardein, which is accelerating at very strong rates. As a reminder, we've made significant investments to expand Gardein's manufacturing capacity, which came online earlier this fiscal year. As the slide shows, the brand's growth is attributed to more than just meatless burgers and includes meatless options for chicken, seafood, and sausages, to name a few. As you can see, it's clear that we remained on track with all our fiscal 2020 operational objectives through the third quarter. Now let's turn to the current quarter and the balance of the year. Typically, we would be spending our time on this call reaffirming our guidance and discussing the short list of initiatives underway to close out the year. But this year is unprecedented, and the impact of COVID-19 will be significant. Let me start by saying that our top priorities right now are the health and safety of our employees, as well as our ability to safely and responsibly meet customer and consumer needs. With respect to our results, the magnitude of the impact is difficult to predict. What we know to date, the Q4 retail demand surge is significant and spans multiple retail channels, including e-commerce. While our food service segment is facing headwinds, that impact is more than offset by increased demand in our retail segments. Given the depth and breadth of our portfolio, we are well positioned to meet this increased demand for at-home consumption. Having all these brands and capabilities under one roof is enabling us to meet a wide array of customer and consumer demands. Importantly, we've been able to address this retail demand surge because of a strong business continuity plan that we were able to activate as soon as the market disruption began. I'm very proud of the extraordinary efforts across our company and the way our teams have supported each other and our business, all in the pursuit of ensuring that consumers are able to access food during this time. We have decided to temporarily delay some legacy Pinnacle Plants SAP implementation to prioritize supplying customers with the food they require now, but our integration plans are otherwise on track. We will continue to consider and prioritize our business needs as the COVID-19 situation unfolds. And I'd like to take a minute to talk a bit more about the ConAgra team, and in particular to highlight the exceptional work of our supply chain team. While demand has sharply increased, our order fulfillment rate so far in Q4 has remained above 90%. This is a testament to the systems we have in place and the commitment of our people. This has been remarkable to see, and I'd like to thank our Chief Supply Chain Officer, Dave Beeger, and the entire supply chain team for their incredible efforts. Our supplies of ingredients and packaging remain sufficient, and we've experienced minimal disruption so far in the quarter. All of our North America manufacturing facilities are open and running at high levels of utilization, and our distribution network remains fully operational. Our plants and locations have the resources and critical equipment they need to operate in full compliance with current regulations and CDC guidance. And I'm proud of the remarkable level of collaboration among our sales, customer order management, and supply chain teams. That collaboration, along with the work we're doing with customers, is enabling us to ensure we are able to supply consumers with the food they need. Great job all around. Although providing specific Q4 guidance is not possible due to the uncertainty of this situation, we do want to give you a sense of our experience so far. The chart on slide 20 shows what we've seen in the market to date. You can see 
that there has been a material increase in demand the past few weeks. While some categories are benefiting more than others, all categories and all temperature states are seeing increases. In addition to a significant uptick in sales, our execution has enabled ConAgra to outperform and gain share in the categories in which we compete. The data we're showing in the chart is only measured channel data. It's important to note that demand has surged broadly across retail channels, including e-commerce, as well as for pickup and delivery, most of which are not reflected in this data. Similar to our measured channel retail business, our e-commerce business is also up in sales, outpacing the competition, and gaining share. Overall, we made good progress during the third quarter of the year. Our quarterly results were in line with our updated expectations, and we remained on track with all of our fiscal 2020 operational objectives. Going forward, our teams are prioritizing health and safety adapting well and operating effectively to ensure consumers are able to access the food they need. And while this is clearly an unprecedented time, we will not lose focus on executing the ConAgra Way playbook. Our brand building and innovation processes remain critical pieces to our long-term success. We're updating our full year guidance today to note that we now expect to exceed our prior full year guidance for total company sales and profit metrics. Beyond fiscal 2020, it's important to note that we are also working with customers as they reevaluate the timing of promotions and shelf resets as they look to minimize in-store disruption during this time of surging demand. Finally, while the situation is still evolving, we believe the sharp increase in at-home eating occasions is generating trial among new consumers that we did not anticipate accessing. We view this dynamic as a long-term opportunity for our portfolio overall, and in particular, our leading frozen business. With that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thanks, Sean, and good morning, everyone. I hope you and your families are all staying healthy and safe. Before I get into the details, I want to remind you that Q3 has been the first full quarter following the anniversary of the Pinnacle acquisition. As a result, Pinnacle's full quarterly results are now reflected in our organic figures. I'll start my remarks this morning by calling out a few highlights from our performance for the quarter, which are outlined on slide 23. As Sean discussed, our Q3 performance was consistent with the expectations we provided at Cagney. This included broad-based category softness early in the quarter and a return to consumption growth in February prior to the COVID-19 related surge in demand. I'll unpack these results further in the slides to come, but overall, for the third quarter, reported net sales were down 5.6% versus the same period a year ago, with organic net sales down 1.7%. The organic net sales decline was in line with the updated expectations that we provided in February. Adjusted gross profit decreased 10.5%, and adjusted operating profit declined 8.9%. We continued to operate efficiently from an SG&A perspective, capturing strong synergies. Adjusted EBITDA, which includes equity method investment earnings and pension and post-retirement non-service income, decreased 7.1% in the quarter. And adjusted diluted EPS decreased 7.8% to 47 cents for the quarter. Again, this was in line with our updated expectations. Let's jump into net sales a bit more. Slide 24 depicts the 5.6% change versus the same period a year ago. As you can see, the broad-based category softness that we discussed at Cagney drove our volume down 1.3%. Also, our price mix was unfavorable 40 basis points as we continued to support many of our brands with incremental promotions. As I mentioned on prior quarterly calls, we expect that our year-over-year -year change in retailer investments to be much smaller and less material in the second half of fiscal 20 and beyond now that this type of spending is in our base. As a result, we will no longer be breaking out that bridging item and we'll return to our historical approach of showing just the impact of price mix overall. Moving to slide 25, you can find our sales summary by segment. In the quarter, 
organic net sales for the grocery and snack segment decreased 3.6%. The snacks business continued to perform well. However, this segment was negatively affected by weather with a warmer than normal winter this year stacked against an abnormally cold prior year. On a reported net sales basis, divestiture activity subtracted 5.9%. Organic net sales for refrigerated and frozen increased 0.3% as the frozen business continued to perform well behind the recent innovation launches. Importantly, as Sean mentioned, we saw frozen meals continue to gain share in an excel at an accelerated rate in the quarter. The strength in the frozen business continued to be somewhat masked by declines in the refrigerated business. Turning to our international segment, quarterly net sales and organic net sales for the segment decreased 3.2% and 1.9% respectively. Throughout the quarter, the segment continued to benefit from the growth in the Canadian snacks business and frozen businesses. Recall that earlier this year, we said that the business in India had a transitory headwind that would rebound in the second half, and that is what we saw in Q3. These benefits were more than offset by economic challenges, primarily in Mexico, and certain planned value over volume actions. Net sales for the food service segment decreased 8% in Q3, while organic net sales decreased 2.2% as divestiture subtracted 5.8%. The organic net sales decrease was driven by volume declines of 4.6% as a result of soft industry traffic trends early in the quarter that were partially offset by a 2.4% improvement in price mix. Turning to slide 26, you can see the adjusted operating bridge for the quarter versus the prior year. As I mentioned on our second quarter call, input cost inflation did start to increase in Q3. In the quarter, inflation was just over 3%, which translated into a 240 basis point headwind to margin. Importantly, however, our gross margin expansion levers such as realized productivity, pricing, mix, and synergies, continued to be effective in Q3. The increased promotional support in the quarter partially offset these benefits, resulting in a 90 basis point improvement in gross margin. A&P had only a modest impact on margin in the quarter, while reduced SG&A spend benefited our operating margin by 100 basis points during the quarter. Slide 27 highlights the significant progress that we've made to date on our overall synergy capture from the Pinnacle acquisition. In Q3, we realized 33 million of incremental synergies, bringing our total synergy capture through the end of Q3 to 145 million. We remain on track to achieve approximately 180 million of synergies by the end of fiscal 20, with 20 million being reinvested into longer term business opportunities. We also remain on track to deliver our total synergy target of 305 million, again, with 20 million of that being reinvested into longer term business opportunities. Turning to slide 28, you will see an outline of our adjusted operating profit and operating margin for the third quarter. Our adjusted operating profit decreased 8.9% in Q3, and our adjusted operating margin came in at 15.7%. Across our segments, realized productivity and cost synergies benefited our operating profit in the quarter. These benefits were more than offset by the impacts of higher input costs, lower organic net sales, inventory write-offs, and lost profit from divested businesses. Slide 29 outlines the various drivers of our Q3 adjusted diluted EPS from continuing operations. In Q3, our adjusted diluted EPS of 47 cents decreased by $0.04 cents compared to the same period a year ago. The decrease in adjusted operating profit and higher tax rate during the quarter more than offset the benefit from improved pension income and interest. Slide 30 summarizes ConAgra's net debt and cash flow information. I'm sure that our perspective on the balance sheet and liquidity are top of mind in these uncertain times. I'll start by reminding you that we have made significant progress towards our deleveraging and free cash flow targets in recent quarters. Since the closing of the Pinnacle acquisition through the end of Q3, we have reduced total gross debt by over 1.5 billion, improving our balance sheet and the overall health of our business. With respect to Q3, we reduced debt by 450 million, while our net debt balance at quarter end was 9.9 billion, and the net debt leverage ratio was 4.8 times. At the end of the third quarter, 
our average debt maturity was approximately 8.8 .8 years, our weighted average coupon was approximately 4.7%, and approximately 92% of our total debt was fixed. Free cash flow year to date is 641 million, marking an improvement of over 100 million against the same period last year. We remain on schedule with our deleveraging targets and are confident we will achieve our fiscal 21 leverage target of 3.6 to 3.5 times. Overall, we remain confident in the strength of our balance sheet and we have many options for maintaining liquidity. First, we ended the quarter with $99 million of cash on hand. We expect stronger cash flows in Q4 due to the normal seasonality of our business and because of the increased retail demand we're experiencing in light of COVID-19. Our capital allocation priorities remain constant. We are committed to maintaining our dividend, deleveraging, and maintaining a solid investment grade credit rating. Along these lines, we anticipate deleveraging further in Q4 of fiscal 20. In addition to cash flow from operations, we also have a $1.6 billion fully undrawn revolving credit facility. During certain months of the year, we issue commercial paper against this revolver to fund working capital needs. We did not need to access the commercial paper markets during Q3, and we don't anticipate needing access during the rest of Q4. Given our strong cash flow and borrowing capacity, we have many options available to fund upcoming debt maturities in August and October. At Cagney last month, we discussed that we continue to explore smart divestitures that can help sculpt top line performance and generate cash flow to support deleveraging. By smart, we mean ensuring that any potential divestiture will deliver a valuation that exceeds our intrinsic value. In this environment, our brands are growing and playing an important role for consumers, and they are generating sales and cash flow in excess of historic levels. While we continue to evaluate portfolio actions, we do not feel pressure to pursue any divestitures that are not value creating. Now, recognizing that our new guidance is in specific, I want to give you some color on what we do know and what we don't know at this point. What we do know is that our retail businesses have seen accelerating shipments. In our domestic retail business, which is about 80% of total company sales, total fourth quarter to date shipments have increased approximately 50% versus last year, similar to the most recent consumption data. Internationally, the impact has been a bit mixed with the Canada retail business seeing increased demand, but some softness in global export. All told, quarter to go retail shipments are difficult to predict given the wide range of possible outcomes. Just as the retail businesses are seeing a surge in demand, our food service business, which is about 10% of total company sales, is beginning to experience the negative impact of the COVID-19 situation. So far in Q4, food service shipment declines have accelerated, and trends imply a Q4 organic net sales decline that could be in the range of down 50 to 60% versus last year. Turning to profit, as you would expect, we believe that the significant demand surge in the retail businesses which are the vast majority of our sales, will positively benefit profit versus our prior guidance. We also expect that the mix of sales and operating leverage of the increased volume will benefit gross margins. Just how much is too speculative to forecast at this time, as we are also increasing investment where needed to ensure we support the surge in demand. We are incredibly proud of the investment we are making in the supply chain to meet demand. Not only are we investing as needed to meet customer orders, but we are providing direct financial support and recognition to our people and communities. I'd now like to turn to our fiscal 20 guidance on slide 33. It was just a bit over a month ago that we shared our updated fiscal 20 guidance. And as we told you at Cagney, we were already seeing improving trends in our categories, giving us confidence in our ability to deliver those updated results. However, as a result of what I just discussed about Q4 to date, we are now unable to forecast Q4 with specificity. But we can say that we expect to exceed the full year guidance on all sales, profit, and cash flow metrics. Although this situation remains highly dynamic, we now see upside to the guidance we provided due to the quarter to date surge in consumer demand 
and the related sales and profit impacts. What we don't know is how long the impacts of this pandemic will last, nor do we know exactly how consumers will continue to adapt to the situation in the immediate term or in the longer term as we move into fiscal 21. As Sean mentioned earlier, our portfolio is well positioned to meet this increased consumer demand, and our team is focused on working with customers to make sure that orders and shipments remain uninterrupted during this time of need. As long as our strong execution continues and there are no other material disruptions to our ability to provide products safely to our customers, we expect to exceed our fiscal 20 guidance across all sales, profit, and cash flow metrics. Thanks for listening, everyone. That concludes my remarks. Sean and I are happy to take questions. Tom McGuff and Darren Sorrell are not joining us today as we wanted to minimize the number of speakers since we are managing this Q&A from different locations this morning. I'll now pass it back to the operator. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. And the first question will come from Andrew Lazar with Barclays. Please go ahead. I've got um, two questions, if I could. Um, first, Sean, I wanted to dig in just a little bit on uh, your comment around, you know, the potential maybe over over a longer period of time for, you know, some stickiness maybe, given, you know, in light of the very significant uh, unanticipated trial that you and a lot of a lot of your peers are, are getting uh, in relation to the, the current crisis. Is, is there any data maybe um, that can add a little context around this? I know it's early, but maybe from some of your panel data that you track around, you know, some of the increases in either household penetration that you've seen um, with some of the quality, you know, enhancements you've done, particularly in the frozen space, maybe what some of the repeat rates or, you know, look like or, the ability to gain, you know, some of the new trialers that might not have, let's say, tried this product in the last, you know, several years or so. And any perspective there would be really helpful. And then I've just got to follow up. Okay, sure, Andrew. Let me uh, tackle that. Uh, the concept you're raising is that because we've got this crisis situation and people are eating much more at home and not away from home, uh, products like ours are getting levels of trial that were not anticipated, and that could turn into uh, consistent users over time as that trial con converts to repeat. I would tell you that makes sense to me both intuitively and in terms of the very early data we're beginning to see. There's been a massive amount of transformation in our categories in the last five years. Frozen in particular doesn't even closely resemble the category uh, that it used to be. Uh, the quality of the food is in a completely different place. And we've seen consumers so far who have tried that new food uh, respond extremely favorably to it, and large established brands that had long been forgotten are growing strongly again. Uh, now, because of this crisis situation, people are at home. As you know, everybody can see it. They're stocking up, and they're stocking up with foods of all kinds across all temperature states, including categories like frozen. So just logically, you know, we know we are getting – higher levels of, of trial here during this uh, phenomenon. In terms of data that, that backs it up, quite frankly, it's just too early to point to a lot of data points. The one place I can tell you that we do look that tends to be a leading indicator is e-commerce. And in the world of e-commerce, what we are seeing is uh, that we are reaching a large number of new triers that we had not reached previously. Now, as you think about how that might convert to repeat, you all are probably accustomed to looking at Na at national average repeat rates. Repeat rates will vary depending upon the user. So early adopters, super, super heavy users will have higher repeat than light users. When you get new triers like this, you tend to be getting lighter users. Uh, so it may not be the kind of repeat rates we get from super heavy users. But the point of all of this is it should uh, help categories like frozen. It should help some of our other categories that people may have forgotten about. Uh, but it's just too early to quantify the impact of that. I would also tell you that we do expect, as this thing gets behind us, 
that we'll see a return to people eating out. Americans love their restaurants. They love to, to eat out. And obviously the food service space is is hurting badly right now. And, and so we, we want, we're rooting for that side of the business to bounce back as well. Great. Thanks very much for that. Just a, a quick follow-up would be on the, on the margin and profitability side, it, I just want to make sure I heard it right. It sounds like, you know, you've got a number of puts and takes. On the positive side, of course, all of the increased volume leverage that's coming through from running at, you know, very high levels of utilization and whatnot. Um, you know, maybe some of the, um, if there's a, a reduction in assortment and focusing on the longest run length SKUs to maximize output and things like that, I, I would think would be on the, on the positive side of the ledger. On the other hand, there are some increased costs as you've talked about, whether it be for employee benefits and things like that, and, and just the simple inefficiencies of maybe running at, you know, whatever, 100% utilization and such. But it sounded like um, you may not know the exact magnitude in the way it all comes together, but that the balance of those things, at least of what you're seeing so far, are more tip more to the positive than the negative. I just want to make sure I kind of heard that right. And thanks so much. Yeah, Dave, Dave, you want to take that one? Yeah, I will. Uh, thank you, Andrew. You, you summarized it very well. Um, I, I think right now, obviously, with, with the volume we're seeing in our domestic retail business, uh, you do get benefits there from, from operating leverage. But, you know, fixed costs are fixed over relevant ranges. We're always taught, right, in, in the significant volumes resulting in incremental costs uh, that we're incurring in the form of overtime, you know, higher spot freight rates, you know, expediting certain supplies, and then uh, additional uh, costs. So when you net it all together and you factor in the, the significant de declines in food service as well, we do expect an increase in gross margin year on year for the quarter, but we, we didn't want to give specificity around that. Thanks so much and stay well. You too. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ken Goldman with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you uh, for the questions. Two for me, if I can. One, um, I, I didn't hear you mention this, but I've been jumping around a little bit. Forgive me. Can you talk a little bit about the shelf resets that were um, happening in May, what your uh, current expectations are for those and how they might affect you? Uh, and the second one is, um, in terms of your promotional strategy, can you walk us through a little bit tactically how you can change some things, whether you want to pull back a little bit. It's been such a big part of how you've um, driven some growth recently. I'm just curious how you think about that in this kind of environment. Thank you. Sure, Ken. Uh, let me try to tackle that, Dave. If I miss anything, by all means, chime in. Um, the priority right now is uh, producing the maximum amount of food that we can possibly produce. And, and we are running our plants uh, seven days, as you might imagine, to do that. We have uh, pared back on some of our SKUs so that we can continue to serve the highest velocity SKUs. So keeping food in stock so we can feed America is our, our top priority right now, as it is the priority of our retailers. Um, that has caused us to, to reprioritize in terms of SKUs. And in the case of the innovation resets, I would tell you the word that comes to mind for me is fluid. Uh, we are hearing different things from different customers. Uh, many, many customers, most customers, are just trying to keep products on the shelf right now. Uh, some customers, uh, big ones, have said to us that they want to continue with the, the shelf set timing. Others had said, you know, we're going to push that back a bit just so we can ensure that we don't have any complexity and any uh, uh, anything going on at the store shelf that's going to be a distraction from keeping products in stock. So we are trying to respond to all of our customers' uh, requests uh, so we can do whatever they want. In terms of our philosophy on innovation overall, it hasn't changed. It is a central part of the ConAgra way that we're going to keep uh, building out our innovation pipeline so it's industry leading, and we're very confident we've got that. And we're, as you know from Cagney, incredibly excited about the innovation slate that lies ahead. How it flows into the marketplace now will probably be uh, a, a little bit more customer by customer than, than all in a, in a tighter window as we previously expected. But I think it will be good news overall uh, because we'll have the benefit of that innovation and, and the pipeline fill helping us next year. Uh, with respect to promotional activity, you know, as you know, uh, we've cut more promotions in the last five years than just about any company in food as we pursue value over volume. We have gotten uh, – uh, more aggressive in the last year where we've seen uh, competition act uh, irrationally and we needed to defend our market shares, but that has not been in a, in a, a broad-based way. What I would tell you on promotions right now is we're honoring all the contracts we have in place, but the practical dynamic 
is that we're in daily discussions with our customers on how to help them uh, meet the needs of their shoppers, and many customers are looking to pull back on promotions as they try to manage the basics of just keeping their shelves stocked. And running promotions can exacerbate out of stocks, which is clearly not their goal right now. So we're seeing some cut back on that, uh, and that'll just be a, more of a timing issue than anything else. Uh, anything I missed there, Ken? No, I know it's a, a you use the word fluid to describe the situation. I think that's the understatement of the day, but thank you for that color, John. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the next question comes from David Palmer with Evercore ISI. Uh, thanks. Actually, just to follow up on that, you know, where the retailers are not doing new shelf resets, you know, what what happens exactly? Are you just keeping some of the more standard items going that are really solutions like the frozen vegetables and holding off on the Gardein healthy choice power bowls that might have been coming and that's more of a back to school item then I have a follow up uh, well David it's customer by customer so some customers um, uh, at this point are, are articulating that they will move ahead as planned, uh, we'll see if that happens. Nobody really knows what tomorrow looks like or next week looks like. And right now, everybody is literally trying to get as many items of all the foods they sell in stock. So, um, but I, I, you know, if if what they're saying plays out, I think you're going to see some customers take it sooner, some customers take it later. And it's not as if those who take it later uh, would be at it in a deficit position. Uh, if this pandemic does not abate anytime soon, because as we're seeing uh, right up till today, the, the consumer pull in this is, is remaining extremely strong across the board. And then just if there are any changes that you're making ter in terms of your marketing, spending, or any sort of reinvestment from this period or that you're gonna planning in the next couple months, what are those changes? And then you mentioned, thanks for those comments on service levels at 90%. You know, how differentiated is that in some of your key categories? In other words, are key competitors keeping up with you on that? And thank you. You know, just in, in reverse order, <clears throat> I, I don't really want to com uh, comment too much on our competitors other to say that I'm just incredibly proud of the food industry in general. Um, I've spoken to my colleagues. Everybody's rising to the occasion here to do the thing that matters most, which is uh, keep our consumers fed and keep our employees healthy. So I would say uh, everybody is operating at the top of their game right now, and I, I think we're certainly uh, fully competitive in in that regard. Um, uh, with, with respect, David, hit me on the other part of your question. Yeah, the, the other the other part was just simply what changes are you making in terms of your marketing, given that. You're obviously in a new world in yeah. terms of demand. Not a lot other than, you know, some of the in-store activities that we would plan in support of new items hitting the shelf. So, you know, you get a new product on shelf, you want to sample it, you want to do some promotion. We'll sync that up to what's going on at that particular customer. As everybody knows, uh, we've been putting more emphasis on retailer level investments. So those are very turnkey. If a product will go into market later, we'll, we'll turn that later. Our base kind of A&P programming remains highly digital, and, and it also remains extremely easy to kind of curate. And as you might imagine, with people eating at home now at a level they haven't done in a long, long time, if ever, uh, we are trying to provide them with cooking ideas and recipes and, and things that uh, will help them understand how to use our products at home uh, in a way that their family finds not only healthy but but delicious as well, and and digital is a and social is a, is a perfect place to do that. It's kind of a utility for our consumers. Thank you again. And the next question will come from Steve Stracula with UBS. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, Steve. Good morning. So, Dave, just wanted to touch base on the balance sheet and the debt pay down that you guys have had to date. It's uh, impressive so far. But wanted to understand a little bit how to think about free cash flow generations. We look forward to address both maturity schedule and liquidity. Think through nine months, your slide says you pay down $645 or $41 million of debt, but guidance is greater than 950 So 
you should be doing three to four hundred million of free cash in the fourth quarter extra divestitures. Can you just help us think through what we should be thinking about to understand the maturity uh, schedule and um, kind of like the numerator and denominator effect of how you get to that 3.5 to 3.6 leverage? Thank you. Sure. Um, so, so as we've consistently said, Steve, our our financial policy has been consistent, right? That we are we are uh, remain committed to solid investment grade credit rating. Since we've closed on Pinnacle, we've paid down over 1.5 billion in gross debt. For Q4, we expect to be cash positive at a higher level than we uh, previously anticipated, and and that additional cash flow uh, we're going to use to to pay down debt. Um, so we don't expect we we're going to be net cash flow positive in the fourth quarter at higher than, than expected levels. Um, so as we, we finish the fiscal year, uh, we'll have our uh, full $1.6 billion revolve, revolving credit line, which will be undrawn. Um, and and uh, we don't have any debt maturities in Q4 of this year. So as we look to fiscal 21, uh, we have $1.1 billion in, in debt maturities for the full fiscal year. Uh, our August maturities of 127 million, we expect it to, to fund that from cash uh, on hand. Uh, our next maturities of 775 million uh, are um, in October, and we'll have flexibility to, to fund that from the higher uh, expected free cash flow from the business, and, and we'll just have to see where we land with that given uh, the, the upside that, that uh, we're seeing right now. Um, we, we can access our revolver um, or we can refinance in the form of either term loans or, or investment grade notes. Um, so as we've been doing every day with our advisors, we'll, we'll continue to monitor the markets and evaluate the best structure for Conagra and stay in a position of readiness. Because, I mean, if you look at the markets today, as you know, um, the bank markets are significantly different than they were two weeks ago. And I expect that they'll be significantly different a month from now. And so, we want to constantly look, see what the markets are saying. Uh, but the good news is that we're cash flow positive. We're generating cash. We're going to use that cash to, to pay down debt. Um, and we have our full revolver. So I think our, our liquidity is very strong. Thanks, David. That's very helpful. Then a very quick follow-up question to that would be on gross margins. When we met with you in Cagney, um, at the time you commented on taking an inventory reserve for the fourth quarter. I have to imagine inventory for all grocery stores, one product right here, right now. So is there any chance that that gets reversed out into the fourth quarter as we think forward? Um, and if I heard you correctly, were you commenting that the retailer trade investment really becomes de minimis from this point forward and kind of like a rounding error as we think forward to fiscal 21? Thank you. Yeah, so um, you're right. At, at, at Cagney, given the softness and volume, we had uh, expected inventory write-offs. And in Q3, we actually did experience both inventory write-offs and some uh, negative operating leverage. So that impacted our Q3 gross margin that, that we reported. Um, as, as we look forward, um, I'm sorry, Steve, what was the second part of your question? It was just something to reverse out was part one on the accounting pieces that come back in Q4. And the second piece was just on the retail trade investments. Does that become de minimis at this point or like a rounding error as we think forward? Thank you. Got it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So as part of our Q4 uh, uh, information we talked about, we expect gross margins to improve in the fourth quarter based on all these dynamics. And so, you know, to the extent that inventory that we thought uh, may not be sold is now moved through, that will be a benefit as part of uh, Q4. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that would be reflected in terms of the retailer investment. Yeah, it's really de minimis. So uh, a lot of the slotting and other investments um, year on year, it's just not as significant. So we're just going to show price mix in total as opposed to break that out now. And the next question will come from Robert Moscow with Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, Sean and Dave, you know, I, I would argue that the pantry loading uh, period is probably coming to a close in terms of consumers loading up their houses. So what are, your te what are you telling your manufacturing facilities to do for the next 30 days or 60 days? Um, are, are you telling them that uh, you know, the, the hours still need to be 
at a highly elevated level because you want to keep up with, you want to expect consumer demand to remain at elevated levels even though, you know, shelves are full. Um, how, how do you how do you communicate to your plants what to make and and how uh, specific does it get brand by brand? Yeah, Rob, uh, we're telling them to make everything they can right now and to and to keep themselves safe and healthy as they do it, and we're helping them to do that. But, you know, simply put, until we're on the other side of this pandemic, sales growth is likely to remain elevated uh, because you've got most of the food away from home volume is moving to food at home. And so, uh, you know, we've got obviously lots of experience with uh, how pantries and warehouses get filled uh, by customers and consumers around uh, situations like hurricanes. And you always see uh, big volumes move into warehouses at the customer level and into pantries and freezers and refrigerators at the consumer level. Uh, but, uh, you know, how long the pull remains in, in this particular case is directly a function of how long does this thing last and how long are people sheltering in place? And I don't think anybody can predict right now, uh, you know, when that is going to end. Obviously, uh, the latest thinking here is, is that we will go until minimum uh, the end of April with, uh, with people really spending lots and lots of time at home. And who knows how much further it can extend beyond that. So the way this works is the initial surge of volume is volume that is going to fill warehouses and to fill pantries. Uh, but with people not e eating out away from home, I think a reasonable person could conclude that they're then in the mode of consuming that volume aggressively. And as they work down those um, pantry levels and warehouse levels come down to normal, normal levels, then, then it just becomes kind of a just-in-time replenishment as long as the elevated level of consumption remains. So, you know, it's just too early to, to pin this with any accuracy, but that's kind of the mechanics of, of how this works. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And if I, if I ask um, uh, a follow-up question, have you tried to dive any deeper into um, single-serve entree uh, demand characteristics versus frozen vegetables? Because my what I remember from the last recession is that single serve entrees they didn't do that great. Um, consumers were making meals for the whole family to try to save money, so that probably benefits vegetables uh, in an outsized way. Uh, do you expect that to happen again, or is it just too soon? Well, in this particular case, I don't think there's any any comparator to what we're experiencing right now because people are eating at home right now, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacking, dessert. I mean, it's all being consumed yeah. at home. And and when you think about all those day parts and you think about the family being together, you've got day parts like dinner where you're probably going to be leaning on multi-serve products, because, which is very different from how our normal society has been operating because everybody is together. But if you think about lunch, it's very much a single-serve occasion because people, kids have online classes, uh, you know, moms and dads have, have, you know, video conferences. People are eating individually. So, and people continue to snack throughout the day. So I see, uh, and we see it in the data, we see incredibly high velocities across multi-serve, single-serve snacks. I mean, you name it, it, right now it's moving. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And the next question will be from Rob Dickerson with Jefferies. Please go ahead. Uh, great, super, thank you so much. Um, so first question, uh, probably some would consider lame, but I'll ask you anyway, uh, because it's something we'll be going through probably you know, in the next few weeks or a few months. Um, it's just, you know, in terms of, you know, forecasts for us, right, whether you're on the investment side or on the sell side, um, you know, we have to plug something into our models for Q4 and think about Q1 and kind of the, you know, progression throughout fiscal 21. Um, I feel like, you know, in general, people haven't been comfortable, you know, punching in, you know, plus 40%. You know, uh, retail, uh, you know, growth expectations and down 50 on food service. Um, but just to be clear, right, like we know what the guidance is now. Obviously, it's a fluid, you know, uh, situation, which is, you know, completely understandable that you can't pinpoint how Q4 plays out or even Q1. But just in terms of, you know, kind of consensus and how we're all, you know, used to, you know, looking at that as a benchmark, I guess the first question is just, like, how do you, you know, how do you think, you know, we should then be modeling, 
you know, the forecast for your business in terms of top line? Is it a, I don't know, yeah, given March is up 40%, you know, a retail consumer, if that were sustainable, then, yeah, I would take that piece of the business and say up 40%, and given our guide on food service, take that down 50 and then we'll just have to see how that plays out, and maybe that reverses next year if there's a pantry load, and maybe not. So just there's a lot in there, but I just kind of wanted to hear, you know, what what do you want us to do in terms of, you know, if there is no specificity that can be provided, um, basically, you know, at this point, you know, the guide is almost irrelevant to an extent as is consensus if we don't model it correctly. Thanks. Yeah. Sean, do you want me to take a shot, or do you want to go? Yeah, let me just make one general comment, Dave, and then yeah. you can take a shot. But I would just say that the unenviable task you all have of kind of um, coming up with consensus is is very similar to the unenviable task we have of things like trying to contemplate fiscal 21 annual operating plan. Uh, as you might imagine, you know, if it's business as usual, it's kind of one set of assumptions. If this thing were to continue, if it were to come back in the fall, as I read this morning, that's a whole nother ball game. So. Uh, you know, it's an almost impossible thing to to predict. Nobody has a crystal ball, but I think what you guys are going to be looking at is the scanner data. What we look at is the scanner data to understand takeaway. What we look at are our shipment patterns, and of course, we follow any um, all the the health news on the national news every single day, multiple times a day. So I think we're in one of these times where uh, we will endeavor to be incredibly transparent. Uh, with what we're seeing, what we're thinking, uh, you know, so so that we can provide, you know, the best perspective we can provide while fully acknowledging that it's awfully, it's, it's impossible task to be precise right now. Dave, you want to add to that? Yeah, I, you pretty much hit it. I, Rob, I would say we feel your pain right on this forecasting. I mean, I've, I've, in my whole career, I've never done daily forecasting, you know, where you're going out quarters and years and all these things. And so, you know, the way we approach it is almost a kind of a, a high, medium, low type scenario of, and that's why we laid out what we did today. We wanted to tell you what do we know right now and what don't we know. And from there, you could then, you know, kind of make some assumptions on sort of, you know, different scenarios. Sean said it, since quarter to date on the, the retail side of the business, domestic retail, which is 80% of our business, shipments and consumption are in line. And so what I would say is, you know, consumption uh, could be a good proxy to, to try to forecast quarter to go uh, in the retail business since since they're in line. There's no guarantee there, right? Because you do have ebbs and flows with shipments versus consumption in a short amount of time. But that I think would be a, a proxy to be able to at least try to figure out how this is how this is trending as we move forward. But uh, there's no silver bullets here, um, unfortunately. That it's all very helpful and makes complete sense. Um, okay, and then just quickly, um, in terms of your shelf-stable products, um, I feel like, you know, even at Cagney, you, you, the focus here going forward, the strategy is more frozen snacks. Shelf-stable can, you know, have a place within the portfolio, but uh, I, my feel at least is that you, you might look at some of those brands uh, more proactively in terms of divestment potential. Um I, now, I, I don't know, right? I mean, I, it seems like, you know, like you piloted today on the slides, um, you know, so, you know, punts, Jeff Bardee was you know, doing incrementally better before COVID-19 hit. Now there's a pantry load. My feel would be that those areas um, would actually now do better maybe than some other areas. Um, so in terms of, you know, the – uh, you know, the tax assets that you have and kind of entire thought process around divestments and shelf stable, what have you might, is it fair to think that, yeah, at least for the time being, given everything that's going on, uh, that you kind of step back from that and say, well, let's just see how things settle, keep the business as is. Uh, we'll reevaluate, you know, as we kind of get through this a bit more. But yes, we still realize that we have an access, you know, a tax asset that's expiring at the net, at the end of next fiscal year. Thanks. Yeah, so let me let me take that. Sure. Yeah, and then you jump in here. Um, so I did I did make some comments, Rob, on uh, on our prepared comments. Uh, you know, the way that we look at divestitures hasn't changed, right? It all starts with our strategic rationale, and then the financial rationale. And, and the point I made today was was financial rationale means that the valuation for any potential divested asset must exceed our intrinsic value for the asset. And 
given the growth we're seeing in our business, given the, the, the sales and cash flow at higher levels than they've historically been, that factors into kind of how we view those assets. They're generating a lot of cash for us right now. Um, but my comments were meant to stress that, you know, we're going to continue to identify assets for divestiture, but if the potential price doesn't exceed the value, uh, you know, the, to ConAgra, um, that, that we see the, the brands are worth, then we don't feel pressure to move forward. And so um, we have our capital loss carry for it. It doesn't, expend, ex, uh, it doesn't expire until the end of fiscal 21. And so, as Sean said earlier, it's fluid, um, but we wanted to make sure that point was clear. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, Rob, uh, just to uh, cover a little bit of a different bit of perspective on what you call the shelf-stable business, I would call it the staples business, and that's how we, we talked about it at Cagney, is we've got a, a decent-sized chunk of our portfolio in what we call staples, and these are products that people rely on. These are, are uh, products that drive a lot of foot traffic to our retailers. They're very important to the retailers. They tend to be high gross margin, good cash flow businesses. And as I pointed out at Cagney, uh, just a small handful of them add up to, you know, a, a big, big chunk of our total staple sales. And so these businesses are very important to us when they are reliably contributing. And most of them have been reliably contributing, and they do a lot of good for our portfolio. Uh, on occasion, we've seen competitive activity or other dynamics drive weakness, and our philosophy historically has been, look, if we don't have a line of sight to stabilizing something on the top line and the bottom line, then, then we've, we've divested it, and we've always been open to that. Um, what Dave is pointing out is these are just different times where everything is moving, so it takes any kind of uh, compulsion to want to move and do that uh, and kind of reduces that because these are, are contributing a lot to us right now. But in general, the point that I wanted to make is uh, our staples businesses across the board almost are very strong, uh, valuable businesses to us, and and we'll continue to, to monitor them to make sure that they are contributing reliably once we get through this pandemic, and then we'll go from there. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Brian Carney for any closing remarks. Great. Thank you. So as a reminder, this call has been recorded and will be archived on the web as detailed in our press release. Uh, the IR team is available for any follow-up discussions anyone may want. Thank you for your interest in ConAgra Brands. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.